What I'm going to do today uh, is what I have done uh, at, at most of these sessions over the last oh, 10 years, is uh, provide you with some idea of how Siegfried um, has looked in the last sort of 20 to 30 years, uh, to give, in, in, in other words, uh, a, basically a production history of Siegfried. Um, and every time I give one of these lectures, I go to the um, uh, Richard Wagner Werkstatt worksite, and I find more and more um, interesting, sometimes confusing, sometimes dead dull productions end up on that website. I found a lot of very interesting material. Um, in fact, I could sort of um, bombard you with about uh, 250 Oh no, maybe even 500 pictures of, uh, uh, of um, uh, Siegfried productions. I actually have about 50, so this is not going to be, I'm not going to try and sort of um, uh, give you sort of too much indigestion. But anyway, before I get down to uh, uh, talking about the specifics of uh, Siegfried on the modern stage, uh, I, I thought it might be just a good idea to sort of sketch out something that I have done many times, sort of the basic sort of contour of Wagnerian productions and the styles in which they have been done since the operas, uh, since the, the Ring was first performed in Bayreuth in 1876. And, and by and large, we can really, I think, see four major styles in which uh, Wagner has been produced over the last 130, 140 years. Uh, and these styles uh, roughly coincide with specific periods, but not entirely. Um, the first of these styles is romantic realism. And I'm going to be showing you some pictures of, of all these styles in a moment. So um, uh, romantic realism is essentially the style, the, the, the label that we give to the style of production in which um, uh, opera, Shakespeare, classical drama, the way in which it was presented in the middle of the 19th century. Um, in which when you went to the theater, you would see a great big realistic backdrop, you would see, see, you would see wings at the side, and basically you would see uh, a, a, a set in perspective. Uh, something that actually, uh, an approach that had been in existence in the European theater since the 16th century. Um, uh, romantic realism, um, uh, obviously the romantic element is important. It tended to present beautiful sets, either of uh, of, 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 of scenery, of natural scenery, or exotic uh, lands. Um, the, both exoticism and natural scenery was something that the urban audiences of the 19th century seemed absolutely to long for. Uh, a, a, another important thing about Romantic Realism is when this, uh, this style was at its height, theatres were still lit by gas, which meant that they did not have a particularly um, uh, um, effective lighting system. In fact, Bayreuth was one of the very first theatres to actually adapt to electricity, but it wasn't actually until the late 19th century that all theatres, in fact, had changed, exchanged gas for electricity. The problems with gas is it was not nearly as flexible in lighting as uh, electricity became. Furthermore, it was extraordinarily dangerous, uh, as you might be aware. Um, as a genre of building, I think maybe theatres have burned down more frequently than almost any other type of building. But anyway, Romantic realism was the way in which Wagner initially conceived his productions. And the, it, it characterizes productions that one could see on the stage from the sort of the, uh, the, from the time when they were first performed through to and perhaps just a little bit after the Second World War. In which, in other words, romantic realism was still quite a very, very strong dominant genre in the European theater, even uh, in, the, uh, in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, even though there was a strongly experimental element in theater at this time. On the whole, most opera productions, be it of Wagner or be it of, um, of Verdi or any other, would be done fundamentally in the romantic realistic style. Um, and I will get down and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail uh, when I've gone through uh, the, the, this list. Uh, the second um, uh, style is symbolism or what we might call poetic realism. And um, this dates from uh, the late 19th, early 20th century theater, you would first see these rather sort of symbolist poetic sets that were not realistic at all. You would see them in the avant-garde theaters of Paris, 
uh, of, of, of London and of, uh, and, and of one or two other uh, European cities. Munich actually had, uh, uh, was, was quite important in this way. Uh, and, and, and this sort of um, style of designing Wagner uh, was uh, sort of, uh, well, using that style to design Wagner, sort of began to come in in the, sort of the very early 20th century, but it didn't really take off until the 1950s and the 1960s. And again, uh, this is something that we will look at in detail. So, um, sim poetic minimalism is, uh, is, is the second um, important style. The third is what we might call Brechtian epic theater. And when we get to this, I'll actually sort of just sort of give you a thumbnail sketch of what we mean by Brechtian and who Bertolt Brecht was. Uh, Bertolt Brecht, for me, he is one of the the, the truly great heroes of the last hundred years. For those people who are not theatre historians, and believe it or not, the vast majority of the world is not, Bertolt Brecht is actually just another name. Uh, so I'll just actually explain a little bit more why, uh, who Brecht was and why his um, approach to directing theatre was important and how it had a very strong impact eventually on Wagner. But essentially, the Brechtian epic style of theatre was introduced into Wagnerian production in the mid-1960s, you would begin to see this approach adopted in some German theatres, um, but it really sort of has gathered weight uh, and, and, and is still with us today. Indeed, in, in particular in the, um, uh, the, the Copenhagen Ring, one can actually identify certain strong influences of Brechtian theatre in the way that that, uh, that, that, that was produced. Uh, the fourth style, um, uh, by the way, Romantic Realism, Symbolism, and, and, and Brechtian Epic Theatre, uh, this is sort of pretty main, mainstream stuff. I think most people would agree that the, these are sort of the, the three major styles come periods in not only the production of Wagner, but in the production of opera as a whole. The fourth uh, is a little bit sort of more uh, sort of my own suggestion, and this is what I would call anti-heroic performance. And by performance, I mean... Um, People coming on stage and telling us they are performing. There is no attempt to try to pretend that the performer is actually the character. Um, I will get into that in, in, in quite a bit, quite quite a bit more detail, just a little bit later. Uh, but essentially, this sort of this anti-heroic performance style um, sort of really sort of finds its way into the uh, European theatres. I would say in the mid 1980s. Uh, and indeed is now extremely prevalent and extremely prominent. Uh, I actually haven't seen Katharina Wagner's Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg. Jeffrey, I know, has, and I wouldn't be at all surprised, actually, if this is the sort of production that could be characterized as anti-heroic performance. She would like to think of it that way, yeah. Uh, because Katharina Wagner sort of certainly does come out of sort of the, um, the latest stable of avant-garde directors in, uh, in, in Europe. Now, um, although the two latter categories, Brechtian and epic theater and anti-heroic performance, um, predominate in the theater today, we still can see vestiges of the other two forms, romantic realism and uh, symbolism. Um, in fact, um, symbolism or poetic minimalism um, perhaps is actually a little bit more prevalent today than I have given the impression when I say it really goes through to the 1970s because we can still see quite a bit of minimalist performance on the operatic stage. Um, romantic realism, I think, is, is, is less prevalent. Um, I will show you one or two pictures where clearly the romantic realistic idiom is still on the stage today. Uh, but on the whole, it, it, it is a style that um, most theatres um, do, do not feel themselves uh, in, in any way almost sort of um, uh, prepared to present on the stage. Um, sorry? Yeah, that, yes, yes, there is one reason they can't afford it, uh, certainly. Um, I, I think also it's sort of in some ways it's sort of... Uh, um, uh, associated particularly with sort of, you know, sort of the older generation of directors. The last of the great romantic realists, um, uh, other than uh, Schenck and Schneider Simpson, if they are that, uh, but the last of the greatest romantic realists on the operatic stage was really Franco Zeffirelli. Uh, and to my knowledge, I don't know, if Fra did Zeffirelli ever do Wagner? 
I, I don't think so. But anyway, th th you remember that sort of style. I, I, it, was, that was, it, was very, it was very popular in the 1960s. I remember he came, came I, when I was a student, he came to Covent Garden, he did Rigoletto with rivers and, uh, and you know, sort of an, 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 an great big Renaissance buildings and other things on the stage. So yeah, they can't afford it now. Of course, nowadays we do use projections. Um, Okay, uh, now um, what I want to do now is to sort of um, uh, focus upon how uh, uh, pictures of how Siegfried has been represented over the years, focusing primarily upon our own time. Uh, and rather than in fact just sort of make a selection from all over the opera, I focused actually on two particular scenes and how these have been represented through the ages. One of them is the forging scene, particularly as we've had a lot of discussion about the forging scene, and we might, might want to sort of see how um, it, it, the design of the, forming, uh, the, the forging scene and the direction of it might actually affect the way in which we understand the forging scene. Uh, and then the, uh, the other um, thing I put in is the dragon. The dragon is always rather an interesting uh, uh, thing to represent. Uh, and, and actually, I do have one or two uh, sh shots also from other um, uh, moments in the action. And then I actually have an occasional excursion into the woodbird. Uh, as you know, the woodbird is my favorite character. In, uh, uh, in Siegfried, and I got one or two, with one or two actually really delightful pictures of, um, of, of woodbirds and how it's been realized. Um, but one thing we might realize, is, uh, we might try to focus on is how does the different realization of scenes affect our understanding of what the opera is actually about? Uh, because uh, um, ultimately, um, directors have a sort of a, a, a wide number of different agendas, and they come to these operas with their own agendas. And but I think one thing I should just say here is, because a director comes with an agenda, this does not necessarily mean to say that he or she is in fact acting in bad faith or he or she is actually acting egotistically. Uh, as uh, we mentioned last night, most directors in the theater are actually highly professional individuals. And they, in fact, look at the work and they really try to, 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 to interpret that work on their own grounds. And it is proof of the tremendous quality and importance of Wagner's work that it can absorb such a tremendous number of different interpretations. In fact, I think probably the only other um, a, a, a great dramatist whose work can, uh, can absorb a, an equal amount of interpretations is Shakespeare. And, you know, we, and uh, one, of the, one of the great things about these works of art is that because they can be interpreted so many different, uh, uh, different ways, those of us who have different points of view and might actually not talk to each other in, 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 in other circumstances can actually often find an interesting common ground of interest in different works of art. Even though we might look at them differently, we can actually find a sort of a nexus within that work. Uh, and therefore, the multiplicity of interpretations that can be given of a work of art is not only a demonstration of its richness, but also the fact that it's serving a rather important social function. Uh, um, I, 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 I think I could say I'm professionally involved in this, but you know, sort of conversations that I have had over the years about playwrights such as Shakespeare or Ibsen or Euripides or whole numbers of other major playwrights and com opera composers like Wagner, Richard Strauss, Mozart, Verdi. Conversations that you have with people can become very passionate conversations and one can often find common ground with people whom otherwise one might not find common ground with. And so, Different, a difference of interpretation is not a sign of perversity on the part of the director, though it could be if the director's bad. In fact, let me just say that. Uh, it, it, you can say, well, how do we know if it's good or bad? Well, you have to judge it yourself to a certain extent. But actually, one of the ways in which I judge whether it's good or bad is, first, does it trivialize the material? And if it trivializes the material, Yes, actually, I do find that I react to it in a very negative way. One of the reasons I didn't like that duet last night was, 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 was Brunhilde taking off her boots. The, the, the music sort of, it, 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 I mean, I don't mind her taking off her boots, but the way she took her boots off sort of seemed to sort of, um, it, it made the music that much less important. Okay, um, now, um, to romantic realism. As I said, this is the style of operatic production that prevailed until really after World War II in most opera houses. And this was the style in which Wagner did initially um, imagine uh, uh, the ring. Uh, 
Uh, and here we have um, one of the most famous pictures. Uh, this is of um, uh, the forging scene from Act One of Siegfried as it was first performed in, uh, uh, in, in, in Bayreuth. Um, in, uh, oh, okay. Um, as it was first performed um, uh, in Bayreuth in 1876. And this is sort of in many ways was, would, would, was a, a very characteristic um, uh, design of the time. Uh, you, you, the, essentially, the scenery is divided into um, uh, the two sections. We would have here the forest at the back, which was um, uh, painted in as realistic a way as they could. Uh, those of you who are familiar with German Romantic art of the 19th century, particularly, say, the paintings of Friedrich and some of the Romantics that followed him, uh, if, you, if you go through art galleries in Berlin and Munich today, you'll find a number of pictures of forests that, in fact, have sort of give this impression of a, a great mighty tangle of branches. But this is sort of, uh, uh, the, the, here's the forest, and here we have sort of um, the, the um, uh, th this is obviously in the front, this is the cave. Um, it is probable, uh, uh, I don't know, and we don't know because we don't have all of the technical documents, that in fact this area would, would have been a practical entrance and that this would also have been a practical entrance as well. Looking at this probably, in fact, there are not many entrances and exits in this scene, they would have probably come through here. But here we have Siegfried, as we can see, dressed as that sort of young, ideal Nordic hero, uh, that, um, uh, is, which is... Um, the, the, the ideal that everybody that, that, that um, everybody had uh, of Siegfried um, um, in the sort of the latter part of the 19th century, and here we have uh, uh, have um, uh, Mima uh, a, a rather designed in that sort of in a way that was similar to the way he was designed in the Schenk Schneer Simpson production. Uh, somebody who's uh, where they're trying to sort of take the the dwarf aspects of the character literally, and uh, you get that sort of um, sense of um, uh, of a uh, an evil um, creeping presence. Uh, so that, that that was the um, the, uh, the this is the the um, sort of the picture that was given of the set. Um, quite clearly, um, uh, the the um, set was not quite as sort of as perfect turned out as it is here. I, I should say that Wagner was not very happy with the set. He wasn't very happy with the sets that Joseph Hoffman did for the entire Ring cycle. They were for him too realistic. There was too much attention upon detail, and as a result, he found it difficult to, in fact, sort of bring the sort of the bare bones of the drama uh, to make those clearer. Uh, and, and we find that um, his own letters, we find Cosima's diaries, are in fact peppered with these sort of these comments that there's a real problem, these are too realistic. One of the problems with Wagner was he was a genius in most areas of human endeavor. He was not actually that much of a genius in terms of visual arts. He actually found it very difficult. He got a sense that there was something wrong here, but he couldn't actually visualize what the alternative should be. Um, one other um, in interesting little detail from uh, uh, this production, here we have Brunhilde with horse, uh, 1876, uh, Amelia Materna as Brunhilde and Cocotte, the black stallion presented by King Ludwig for the role of Grana. So even though Ludwig was still angry with Wagner for not actually having come to the Munich performances of Das Rheingold and, uh, and Die Valkyra, um, he still actually not only uh, devoted a ho gave a horse, but actually did uh, give uh, considerable sums of money for the building of the Festspielhaus. Uh, but uh, this, would, th this sort of uh, degree of, um, uh, of, of realism is what would have been sort of very much to the, uh, to the, um, the, the choice of audiences in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, here we oh, sorry. Uh, here we have um, Alma Materna. Um, uh, we, we notice that um, she has this sort of this uh, sort of winged helmet. It's not quite as gigantic as the winged helmets that would have been worn by uh, by Wotan uh, and indeed maybe by some of the other gods. Um, uh, but, and um, otherwise, we sort of we see a sort of a costume that is sort of really sort of mythical realistic, I suppose. Um, so, um, do, we, do we ever see this? Um, uh, romantic realism is actually um, still with us, um, though it tends to be with us in productions that have a conservative agenda. Uh, that might be too much of an exaggeration, uh, of, of a generalization, but that tends to be uh, the case. Um, uh, 
uh, and, and in some ways, uh, sort of romantic realistic productions are often put on in a spirit of, we don't want everything that the modern world has given us and we want to somehow go back to the original. Um, which is fine, with the exception of the fact that we do know that Wagner himself was not very satisfied with what the original was. And he was actually the first of the directors who in fact wanted to find a new way other than romantic realism uh, to do his own work. Um, perhaps there is one contemporary production that has fully embraced romantic realism, and that is the Seattle production of The, of the Ring that was first staged, I think, 1999. Um, here we have the forging scene. I'm sorry, that's not quite as clear an HD a picture I would like, but it was the best that I could find. Um, uh, first production, 2000, I beg your pardon. Uh, and um, uh, this is, uh, uh, we, we can see here, uh, in, in some ways, a, a parallel to what was done in Bayreuth in 1876. There we have the sort of the, um, I'm, 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 I'm can't, not quite sure what this is, but this actually is the uh, construction that was used for forging the sword. Uh, we have here sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a, a patio that looks sort of rather in northwestern style. But of course, the dominant thing, and those who've seen the production know these do dominate, is the scenery. You know, we have here uh, trees that you would see in the Cascades, and indeed, the whole production itself, in some ways, sort of tried to be sort of a, you know a, sort of a, a, a transference of the ring into the Cascade scenery. At times, it was very beautiful, uh, and, and at times, um, the scenery was rendered with absolutely microscopic detail. We didn't talk about HD in 2000, but looking back on it, I felt, you know, I really got that impression we're seeing a high-definition version of, um, of, 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 um, of, of the, the Cascades. Um, the uh, slaying of the dragon in Seattle uh, was also a, a, um, a fairly naturalistic affair. Um, when I saw it, the dragon was a sort of a monstrous Chinese sort of, um, uh, it, it, it was a big Chinese monster. And actually sort of there were some people came on and they had sticks and so they waved it up and down and Siegfried sort of fought the, the head of this, of this great Chinese dragon. Um, but uh, one thing in, in Seattle, that at least they used to do when they had money, is they used to change the dragon every year. It was a rather a fetishistic thing that, you know, what is the dragon going to be the next time? Uh, and, and here it looks sort of pretty much like some sort of um, rather sort of grotesque outgrowth of the trees, um, uh, 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 rather than a sort of an independent um, uh, monster. Um, uh, this is, I'm not quite sure which uh, year this is from, but it's certainly not from the year uh, when I saw the production. Um, but um, this, the whole thing, as I say, it was a fairly naturalistic affair. Um, uh, and nature themes were very much to the fore. And I think actually this is where the sort of the particular strength of the Seattle uh, ring resides, is in it bringing to the fore the whole issue of environmentalism. And this, by the way, has had a considerable impact upon other productions. Those of you who saw the Francesco Zambello a few years ago in, uh, well, here, of course it was. It was first here uh, and, 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 and then in uh, San Francisco. Um, uh, you'll recall that there are some very strong environmentalist themes, particularly, by the way, in Goethe Demerung, which was the one that was not staged here, where the whole thing ended with a, with a, 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 a tree in a, in a pot being brought onto the stage. Actually, I thought rather effectively. Um, but um, anyway, the main justification of the Seattle production um, uh, actually did seem to be a revival of an old style. Um, and it um, uh, only examined, it was only new, I think, in terms of its particular interest in environmentalism and questions of pollution, which are, of course are very close to us today. Uh, but in fact, it was on the whole a pretty uh, uh, um, con uh, conservative production. They even had a real horse on stage, which was really... Um, it, 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 when the horse came on, people are not used to seeing animals on stage today. And when they do come on stage today, everybody started giggling. Uh, it's sort of, you know, it's like, 
were a little bit uneasy because we always think the horse is going to, uh, to, 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 to bolt. And seeing that this horse was actually about, if I remember correctly, about five, uh, ooh, eight or nine feet above the stage floor, if it had bolted, there could have been some, some trouble. So I suppose the poor thing was fairly well, uh, well drugged. Now, romantic realism is not entirely out of style elsewhere. And I do have to confess that every now and then when one does see it, it actually is really rather pleasing to see it. Um, uh, and, and one of the reasons I think why uh, uh, people are sort of still sticking to the romantic realistic style is the sort of the growing interest in environmentalism and a realization that the ring in fact really can be read from an environmentalist point of view uh, uh, and, and, and this can really enrich in our idea of the score. I did come across one production that seemed to have quite a strong sort of romantic realistic dimension and this is Bari where it was in, in, in the, on the southeast coast of Italy um, where it was produced in uh, uh, 2010 by a director by the name of Pagliaro. I don't know who he is. Uh, and um, uh, looking through a lot of pictures of this, there was a considerable amount of greenery on the stage. Unfortunately, it was not, e uh, the, not easy. Uh, you know, stage photographers, like um, video directors, always seem to want to hone in to get sort of uh, little details and it's often very difficult to sort of get pictures that give us the whole scene and I wish we could do that a little bit more because when we go to the opera house that is what we sit and look at the whole time and while I, I do welcome the fact that uh, video art videographers and stage photographers can get in and take pictures that we can't see as members of the audience, at the same time, it would be a good idea to get a sort of a broader idea. Uh, so I didn't see a sort of an overall picture of this, but wherever Siegfried cavorted, there seemed to be greenery. Um, here we have got, he, he, he fought, uh, this is him fighting the dragon, um, uh, which, which looks as if it belongs to uh, a fairy tale uh, but they did have a wholly delightful wood bird who is this sort of this 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 veiled lady here um, who's sort of uh, who's sort of by a swing I don't know whether actually she was initially found swinging but if she was that would be a lovely way to represent the wood bird because there is a sort of a freedom and a playfulness in the wood bird that is I think a, a, a very important um, this production in Bari actually uh, seemed to have um, the charm of a fairy tale uh, and in fact it seems on the whole both from the pictures that I'm showing you here and of others I've looked at it does seem to have sort of have, have, have hearkened back to the time of fairy tale um, there, there, there may possibly have been an Arthur Rackham like sort of quality to the production as well so there we have really sort of the, the romantic realistic sort of uh, approach to Wagner uh, that it, we can still see um, in the theatres today, though n n not at all prevalently. We see it vestigially. Um, a little bit more to the fore is, 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 is symbolism and poetic minimalism. Uh, now, uh, the symbolist movement um, of the late 19th century was really a movement that reacted against naturalism, that actually reacted against a lot of the literalism that you find in theatrical production, that you find in highly detailed realistic novels from the, 18th, uh, from the 19th century, um, uh, and, and, and often a highly realistic art. And symbolism, uh, it's the, 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 the ideal of symbolism was to sort of um, suggest through art a, a reality that lies beyond, beyond the reality that we live with in everyday life. Um, so it really sort of uh, set itself against the realism and naturalism of the uh, 19th century. And while quite a bit of symbolist art, and you might be familiar with it, particularly from the Viennese secession, Klimt, a very, very noted uh, figure from the symbolist movement, while a lot of symbolist art is actually quite decorative, though non-realistic, there was also a very strong tendency, particularly in the theatre, to move towards minimalism. In other words, using less to say more. And the first person who actually gave us an inkling that, that, that minimalism was going to be a valid way of representing Wagner's operas was Wagner himself. Because when he directed Parsifal in 1882, there's a, and I've already quoted this, but I'll sort of do it to you before, but I'll mention this again because I think it's very important. He said, as we were rehearsing Parsifal, we realized that a half gesture was more effective 
than a complete gesture, that a suggestion works better than a statement on the stage. And I think this is the crucial difference between romantic realism and symbolism. That symbolism suggests to us, it's up to us as members of the audience to actually imagine what's going on. We have to fill in the space with our own thoughts. In contrast to romantic realism, which rather like so many movies, you know, sort of presents us just with things as they are, and we're not really sort of encouraged to sort of think beyond. And thinking beyond was something that Wagner wanted us to do. Now, it, uh, the, the main um, sort of uh, change uh, from a symbolist point of view uh, in, in terms of stage design uh, came from this gentleman here, Adolf Appiah, uh, who, whose dates are 1862 to 1928, a very, very important figure, actually foundational for modern stage design and stagecraft. Uh, all designers are still actually trained uh, and, 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 and very appropriately in the basic principles of, uh, of design that Appiah um, uh, developed. Um, but um, Appiah um, uh, pointed out, um, well, when he was very young, he came from a Calvinist family in Geneva. And because his family was so strict, he was never allowed to go to the theater. He was allowed to go to concerts, and so he first heard Wagner's music in concerts, and he first heard operatic music in concert. Then when he was 18 years old, he got his majority, and he went to the theater. And actually, the first production he saw was one of Gounod's Faust, and it was deeply, deeply disappointing to him because he felt that, in fact, the, the imaginative world released by the music was not just negativized, but by the, by the, was not sort of neutralized by the stage, it was actually negativized. He found that there was a complete contradiction between what the music said and what the stage represented. And when he was 20 years old, he went to Bayreuth, where he saw the first performance of Parsifal, well, the first production of Parsifal. And he was, again, very deeply disappointed by this. He felt that the literal attempt to create the, 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 the Temple of the Grail, the gaudiness of the, uh, the, the flower maidens and the whole uh, Kundry scene, um, and, and, and then, again, the, the very elaborate flowery qualities of the Good Friday uh, uh, scenes. Um, th this, he felt, totally went against what Wagner was trying to say in the music. So he was the one who really identified a major gap between what happened on stage and what was going on in the pit and out of the singer's voices. And so he actually sat down and wrote three books. Uh, well, this is actually over, over his whole career, uh, but uh, it was in the 18, early 1890s that he sort of, he, uh, the, the late 1880s and early 1890s, he, he wrote um, books um, uh, suggesting how uh, Wagner's operas should be produced. And he developed a whole series of very um, minimalist designs. And he pointed out that if you just suggest rather than state, you can actually really dr first draw your audience in. And the other thing that was very important is the action becomes that much clearer. When we can see actors against a blank surface and we can see their bodies, we actually can understand the relationship between them more than if they're surrounded by naturalistic detail. This is actually what I found was the problem with the Seattle ring. There was so much detail around there. You said, I want to see what the person's doing. I don't want to see what that buttercup is, is doing up there on the cliff. Uh, and this was something that, that, that Appiah recognized. And of course, one of the designs that he, uh, did, he designed was uh, the Valkyrie Rock. And this was uh, how he suggested the whole Valkyrie Rock, which of course includes sort of the, 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 the final scene of Siegfried. This is the way in which it should be uh, presented. And uh, many of us have actually actually uh, uh, seen, um, seen productions that clearly have sort of been based on that. He took his designs, um, there, there are many designs that he did for Wagner's um, uh, music dramas, he actually took them to Bayreuth and presented them to Cosima and said, you know, isn't this perhaps the basis by which we should start doing Wagner? But Cosima was an extraordinarily literal lady, and she said, no, we have to do them the way Richard wanted them to be done, which is basically according to the production book of 1876 of The Ring, and indeed from, of the other operas, production books from back in, so the, in, in the 1860s, uh, um, uh, particularly of um, Lohengrin and, uh, and, and Die Meistersinger and Tannhäuser, which are first done in Munich. Uh, uh, he actually, she actually insisted that we have 
to go back and we must follow those production books. Uh, th this, of course, is always a, um, a, a recipe for disaster um, because you, you just limit, you, you, you chain down people's imagination rather than release it when you say they have to follow books. Uh, so anyway, uh, Cosima um, uh, really um, indignantly rejected Appiah's designs uh, and he went off and then actually um, had a, a, an important career in which he really theorized this design. He was not himself a vastly practical man. One of the productions he did design for La Scala was uh, Tristan and Isolde, which has wonderful sets, but apparently were totally impractical. Uh, and um, Toscanini was, uh, uh, was, was the, uh, the conductor, and Toscanini felt that this was um, you know, one of the most important productions that he was ever to put on. But unfortunately, the, 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 um, the, the sets just didn't stand up. Um, but symbolist design, and we, and we call essentially this sort of this, this, this approach is, is basically symbolism in theatre because you sort of your, your imagination is taken beyond what you see on the stage to, uh, to something else, the, 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 the numinous world that Schopenhauer said we were all moving toward. Um, but the symbolist designs on, uh, uh, of Wagner uh, were first seen in Germany in sort of the 1920s. Um, and not only were they seen in Germany, they were seen in Bayreuth, um, even before Cosima died. She died in 1930. But even before Cosima died, you actually can begin to see, particularly in the designs of Praetorius and some of the other designers in the 20s and the 30s, you can actually begin to see symbolism creeping into uh, Bayreuth production. I better not say creeping into because actually I think it was very it's it's it's, it's a very positive there's sort of there's a there's a transformational quality there uh, and, and indeed if you look at some of the early 1930 productions you almost have the impression that perhaps they were actually primarily symbolist and that in fact Appiah himself could have been involved in them uh, but then of course along came 1933 and the uh, co-option of the uh, of the, the Bayreuth Festival, by, in particular by Hitler, who saw it almost as his personal domain, and there was a return then just to the sort of the way it had been done in the 19th century. Um, uh, but it was really not until the 1950s that uh, suddenly uh, the symbolist approach became of major importance. And this was, of course, in Bayreuth under the direction of Wieland Wagner, Richard's uh, grand grandson. Uh, and, and Wieland Wagner had begun as a director in the 1930s, and he had directed both in Oldenburg, a small, uh, a, a small uh, uh, German opera house, and then he had done some work in Bayreuth, basically in the sort of the old romantic realistic tradition. But when it gets to the 1950s, although they actually did revive at the first of the post-war festivals, they revived a very traditional... Um, uh, uh, Meistersinger, uh, the big moment was... Parsifal. And I, uh, um, this is actually, this is not Parsifal, I beg your pardon, this is actually Siegfried. Uh, but the big, the big moment was Parsifal, and Parsifal was done in a totally symbolist style. And then he went on, and then he did the whole canon in a symbolist way, even De Meistersinger. And here we have actually got Siegfried in the forest. In other words, this is Siegfried at the dragon's lair. I don't actually, couldn't find, uh, put my, uh, uh, my, I couldn't find a, a picture that actually had him confronting the dragon. But there's some really interesting things here. This is, in fact, sort of the true sort of symbolist style. Everything is suggestion. Nothing is stated. We have a sort of that dappled lighting there in the middle. It's very impressionist, but it gives a very clear idea of the forest. Um, but um, the, the, if you read some of the really informed criticisms of the 1950s, uh, those people who really actually embraced what VLAN did, uh, Ernest Newman is one. Ernest Newman said, we didn't feel the forest, we were in it. You got that sense of being absolutely drawn onto the stage. Actually, uh, a, a dynamic that that uh, uh, Bayreuth stage has wonderfully, where everybody sort of feels themselves drawn into this sort of this space in front of them. Now, actually, they, they adopted um, uh, minimalism for many reasons. First, economics. They didn't have um, much money in Bayreuth in the 1950s. And in fact, the simplest approach was, quite frankly, uh, the, the cheapest to use. One of the great things is that Wieland Wagner himself was a great visual artist. 
and he actually could use a minimum amount of material and make a tremendous effect with them. Uh, I never saw a Wieland Wagner production, but from people I know who did see them, they say they were extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, another reason why, uh, why they adopted it was they wanted to depoliticize Wagner. And so this was really an attempt to try to sort of take Wagner away from all the associations that had gathered around him uh, during the Nazi period. Um, and um, I think the third reason, uh, and this is something perhaps that only occurred to them after, in fact, they'd initiated romantic, uh, the, uh, uh, this poetic uh, um, or minimal, poetic minimalism, um, the third reason is audiences actually found themselves tremendously absorbed by the drama uh, and that um, the, um, the, the, we saw the actors much more clearly. And so even though there was less actual realism on the stage, there was a more bigger focus actually on the drama itself. The important thing was everything was suggested, and, and so the whole work sort of lived, as it were, inside one's imagination. Also, and here we have one picture that actually is from elsewhere in the opera, um, we have, uh, this is the, the, the famous ending of uh, uh, Siegfried. Uh, this is uh, in the, um, that duet that I expressed so many uh, misgivings about yesterday. And actually, I would love to have seen this, because it seems to me that this sort of setting is absolutely I ideal for that sort of, uh, uh, of, of um, uh, of duet, uh, a completely bare stage, and just uh, and, and you accept on a stage like this that the characters can be static, and so actually you could really listen to the music with uh, uh, considerable attention and not be distracted too much by the realism that we seem to be so concerned about getting into representations of uh, sort of, of of love duets today. The other thing, of course, about this is that the uh, uh, the, the stage uh, represents. It's been seen as a stage of the world. It has also been seen as representing the female breast. In other words, there is this sort of this sort of uh, there's a strong quality of sort of of motherliness and nurture that comes out of it. I, I must admit, I do think those it, 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 it's it's very very striking, and uh, um, you can see how within oh just uh, a matter of years. Uh, well, uh, let's put it this way: when when Bayreuth opened in 1950, most people were still expecting to be seeing uh, romantic realism. This dates in the mid 1950s. So, really, very quickly, there was a sort of a very different approach. Um, and, produ and Wieland's productions were noted for their sparseness, but also for their beauty and for their exceptional lighting. Uh, and I, as I say, I think one of the great things is, is Wieland himself was a great artist and could actually use these minimal uh, resources very well. Um, supposedly the most conservative of all modern rings was the Otto Schenk Gunther Schneider Simpson production in, uh, um, uh, at the Met. Um, now, in fact, there are elements, as we did see, of romantic realism in that production, but I actually only did see actually one production of it on the stage, and this was of Die Valkyra. And the moment I saw it, I thought, oh gosh, they've been reading Appiah, because there actually was a tremendous amount of Appiah-esque minimalism in that production. Uh, here we have, um, uh, this is, um, uh, I, I, I'm, well, actually, probably some of you know better than I do. I think this is... Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's sort of it's this is this is the the top of the mountain, and we can see here quite clearly um, this is uh, very close to uh, to 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 um, Wielandesque minimalism. Um, it's a style that has largely gone out of fashion now. We tend not to see it too much, though it it, it is there. Notably, of course, in Robert Wilson, a lot of Robert Wilson Wilson's productions have. Um, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, Robert Wilson's productions have, um, you know, a very minimalist sort of uh, approach. And, and um, uh, I'm thinking of uh, some pictures I've seen. There's, there's been a production of The Ring in Aeon Provence in recent years, but I actually couldn't find pictures of it this time, uh, which in fact sort of uh, had a very sort of minimalist approach. But on the whole, this does tend to be an approach that has been, um, uh, that is not, 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 um, uh, followed quite so much now. Um, now, to move on to the third one, Brechtian or epic theater. Um, perhaps this is the most widespread approach to directing and designer, uh, designing Wagner uh, today. Um, it's a Brechtian one. Uh, and in many ways, uh, this isn't surprising. Um, for one thing, the themes in Wagner's ring uh, 
And the philosophy in Wagner's Ring is, believe it or not, very close to many of the beliefs and the philosophies that Bertolt Brecht had. There's actually the considerable sort of intellectual sort of affinities between them. But just briefly, Bertolt Brecht was a German theater director of the sort of the first half of the 20th century. He actually spent a considerable amount of his life in exile because he was extremely left-wing. He was one of the first people to leave Germany in 1933. And actually he spent most of the war in Los Angeles. Uh, and only went back to Berlin in uh, 1947. But it was, uh, uh, and, and from 1947, of course, he developed his famous company, the Berlin Ensemble, in East Berlin. Uh, and uh, Brecht developed uh, a, an idea of theatre as, as, as um, particularly was interested in political theatre, um, a theatre in which we were all aware of the workings of the stage, a theatre also in which we are aware of the workings of choice. In other words, he said, whenever we see something on the stage, we should be aware that the character who is representing, the character being represented on the stage has a choice, and we should be aware of that choice. Another important thing was he developed the idea of alienated acting, which has been vastly misunderstood in uh, 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 outside Germany, actually in inside Germany as well. People think alienation means, oh, we don't want to get emotionally involved in what goes on. Now, what, Wagner, what Brecht actually meant by alienated action is that we look at the action and we are actually sort of, we don't identify with one person. We don't sort of try to sort of um, treat the piece as a melodrama, that this person's good and this person is bad. Rather, we become ourselves tremendously concerned and focused upon the, 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 um, uh, the theatre as a whole. Um, but anyway, um, Brecht and Wagner, uh, while Wagner did think primarily in the romantic realistic mode, the Brechtian mode of theatre, the epic theatre, uh, was, was, was very different. Um, but both of them were interested in the same things, the problems of capitalism, the dilemma of what it is to be a good ruler, political ideology, in fact, the ideology of Wagner and the ideology of Brecht, even though they were about sort of 70 years different, one can see a sort of a, a, sort of a genealogy that goes between those thinkers uh, such as Feuerbach that Wagner, in fact, was strongly influenced by, uh, and then by uh, the, the, the thinkers of um, the early 20th century that Brecht was influenced by. Um, the most famous example of Brechtian theater well, actually, it's half Brechtian theatre and half not, but the most famous example of Brechtian theatre, and the one that you'll still find coming up in the history books, is, of course, Patrice Schirer's production of The Ring that came out in, that, uh, that was first performed in Bayreuth in 1976, was, as we heard last night, a vastly controversial production when it was first put on. Scherer himself would have been murdered had he been seen in the streets of Bayreuth. By the time it went, it went in 1981, five years later, it was cheered off the stage, not because people wanted to see it go, but because they considered it to be a masterpiece. And in fact, the DVDs that we have were actually made specifically to preserve this production. Uh, it was a production which changed over the course of five years. So, so, so what we see on the DVDs is really the final version. Uh, and um, uh, Shero, um really commits primarily to an industrial theme, though he does have, um, uh, the, he, 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 there is a strong sort of mythical dimension to a lot of what is going on on stage. Uh, here we have the forging of the sword um, uh, of Notan by a rather oppressive machine. Uh, and I am mindful of what J Jeffrey said yesterday, and I think there's a, um, that there is a, po a, a good point here. Uh, in the DVD, I'm not quite so sure that, that Siegfried is quite as far away from the machine as he might have been when you saw it. He seems to be a little bit more involved in it, but certainly we don't have the sort of the hammering out. And so what we do is we sort of, we bring out very much to the fore uh, the sort of the, the, the industrial theme that, that I touched upon uh, yesterday. Um, I, I found, find the effect of the, uh, of the um, uh, Chero Ring, uh, which um, I actually have only seen on DVD, but I've seen it a number of times, is I feel it actually clarifies the action, and above all, it heightens the tragic dilemma at the heart of the ring. And this is, I think, where Brecht really is quite an important figure, because Wotan, who until this time had been put up as somebody we should admire, in Donald McIntyre was just presented to us as 
a ruler. And we're not quite sure what sort of a ruler. He's sort of like a 19th century clansman. He could be a CEO, not really. But, you know, there, and there is sort of a, a very royal quality to him as well. And as the opera goes on, that dilemma of what it is to be a good ruler becomes clearer and clearer. And while we don't ever feel sort of soft and sentimental toward Wotan, we understand the situation he finds himself in with considerable pain. And that's what Brecht wanted from the theatre, that we understand the situation. And then, of course, we understand the terrible dilemmas of people caught in this situation. But we, there's that degree of objectivity. And that's something I think was achieved uh, very well in the, in, in, in the uh, Sherry Ring. He does not really use alienation effects, uh, which were later to be used by other directors, uh, uh, Ruth Berghaus uh, in, in particular. Uh, but certainly he did give a crueler and much harsher uh, uh, version of the ring than we are accustomed to. Uh, but this was all saved by superlative staging. Shero is one of the great masters of blocking. Um, Harry Kupfer uh, in Berlin, and actually had we seen it l uh, last night in, uh, uh, in, in Barcelona, uh, here we have Harry Kupfer. Uh, this is the forge, um, which is reminiscent of an aerospace machine. Industry becomes a dominant presence, and as I'm sure you're aware, this has been a very sort of common theme in a large number of, uh, of, of modern uh, Wagner productions. Um, another thing that, in, that, that, that actually um, makes us, um, belongs, I think, in the sort of the Brechtian category is the recent use of hundreds and hundreds of extras on the stage. I, I think the first person to do this was Robert Carson who did that incredible Rheingold in, in, in Cologne, where the, the giants were um, trade, trade union uh, uh, representatives. And the, they had so what seemed to be 50 or 60 characters, all in, 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 um, uh, in um, uh, orange suits uh, or orange dungarees, all moving over the stage. And you got the sense of the whole world going on around, uh, around the, the action. And it was very exciting as a result. And this is something I think that has been taken up by uh, a lot of directors. And I know that one or two of you here have probably seen uh, some of these productions. But uh, rings with masses of people on stage seem to be becoming quite popular, um, as long as the company can afford it. It is, of course, difficult to pay for all those people. Um, but um, uh, in these productions, uh, very often, the industrial process is represented as a communal process in which many people are engaged. And Siegfried is sort of posited, perhaps, as a future leader of industry. Now, finally, to um, um, how, long, how much longer do I have? 15 minutes? 15 minutes, good. I'll be done in 15 minutes. Uh, to, um, what, what, to sort of non-heroic domestic comic performance. Actually, this sort of really covers a sort of a, a whole range of the very eclectic way in which Wagner is done today. Uh, it's very difficult to generalize on operatic production to say today and say we are dominated by Appia-esque symbolism or we are dominated by Brechtian epic. We can't really do that um, because uh, production, operatic production has become so extraordinarily various in the last 30 to 40 years and I do hope that the economic crisis that opera companies are going through at the moment is not going to in fact ultimately squelch this uh, their variety. I, I think there's a danger that it might. Um, but we are in a period where almost anything seems to go. Um, but, I, but as I say, we should not this, dismiss this as being a bunch of e egotistical directors who wish to display their own skills at the expense of the music and of the text. Indeed, this is very rarely the case. Most directors do have a very distinct vision in mind. It might be an unconventional vision. It might be a vision that we don't agree with, but there is consistency um, in, in what they do. Um, and I think we do need to take them seriously. And we also need to take them seriously for one other reason, and I should stress this. It's one of the great advantages that the theater has, be it spoken theater or be it operatic theater. Um, we can, if, if we just read a novel by Charles Dickens or a poem by John Donne or something like this, we have to really go back unaided into the period of the past. And that itself is actually a very good thing to do. It's one of the reasons why we should be reading literature from the past. That sort of, we, we, we go back and, and, and we, we, uh, we, we discover um, what made people 
what, how people thought back in the 17th century, how they emoted, how they sensed the world. One of the great things about theatre is, is that um, we can uh, get the idea of, uh, or do that reading as literature, uh, or we can hear Wagner just on, uh, on CD, and we can ourselves actually sort of explore for ourselves what the world was like when that work was performed. But the great thing about the theatre is, the theatre also modernises, and the theatre also says, says, here we are meeting the art of the past, and so we get some idea as to how that art has changed over the course of the years. I find one of the most, uh, the, uh, one of the things I like doing more than anything else is doing period performance work and doing it from a historical perspective. So you can actually see how uh, Shakespeare or how uh, important writers, how their work changed in meaning over the years and became something different, but still something equally important to the people who are witnessing it. We have to remember that Wagner's works are timeless, not because there is something, uh, there's an unchanging truth that they articulate. They're timeless because they have appealed to, ev to the changing ideas of every single age. Every single age has been able to identify themselves with, with, with Wagner, and therefore it's the changeability of his work that is actually um, of, 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 um, of importance. Uh, so it's timelessness because it, in some ways it's timely. Um, so anyway, um, so the, so one of the great things about production is they express the spirit of the age. Uh, and what is that spirit? Um, well, um, in some ways, uh, the current generation of directors in Europe, most of whom are in their sort of 30s, 40s and 50s, the most influential uh, uh, um, uh, generation, um, uh, they tend on the whole to be extremely suspicious of opera. Um, and this is generational. And you can still find this extreme suspicion, particularly in Germany, because there has been this whole sort of reaction against the culture of the parents, the culture of the sort of the late 19th century and the early 20th century, which eventually gave rise to the Second World War, or let me put it more, perhaps more, the Great War, the war from 1914 to 1945, was created in many ways by um, the, the, this particular culture. And so, uh, younger generation, and, 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 and I'm talking about, the, 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 as I say, about people in Germany now in the 40s and the 50s who have very strongly rejected their parents, um, really uh, are trying to re-evaluate these works. And it's a tremendous strength that they have not jettisoned Wagner. It's a great strength they haven't jettisoned the art of opera. They are just going back to redefine it because there is something so important in these works, it has to be sort of uh, redefined. And so I, f I feel that modern production, far from being a, 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 a blot on the landscape, something that's sort of devastating opera, I think it's the lifeblood of opera. I think opera is only going to survive when we find, when we see how the works of Wagner do survive in our own time. Um, we're also, by the way, at a time when we're aware that theater, effective theatre comes from a generic mix. This is where uh, Siegfried, I think, particularly appeals to us today. Uh, when the, we realize that when the tragic and the comic rub up against each other, uh, by the law of contrasts, everything gains in power and in piquancy rather than the other way around. A tragedy even more tragic because we've had comic moments. Uh, now, the commonest treatment of, uh, of Siegfried uh, tends to be, uh, these days, I think, the domestication. We saw domestication very clearly in the, um, in the Copenhagen uh, ring last night. Um, uh, Notung has increasingly come to be forged out in kitchens, not in, uh, uh, in workshops that are hewn into the mountainside. Um, and actually, in this age when almost everybody seems to own a gun, <laughs> Uh, this moving of uh, the, 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 the forge into the kitchen, into the domestic area, I actually find uh, carries an alarming currency. Um, here in a production that I've spoken about before um, is um, uh, in Enschede in, 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 uh, the, in the Netherlands, a production by Anthony MacDonald that has had absolutely rave reviews. Uh, here we have got uh, the, the forge inside sort of something that looks like a cross between a, 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 um, a, a garage uh, and a workshop. Um, and, with a, and there is a kitchen-like element to it as well. We have here, I don't think you can see it, um, a, um, a pram. Uh, we have certain 
certain scenic elements that actually remind us of uh, Siegfried's, um, uh, um, Siegfried's um, uh, childhood. Um, so there are stage props that are, that are, are strewn around that relate to the wider issues of the action. Um, um, Robert Carson, in his, his great uh, uh, Cologne production, when he did Siegfried uh, in 2001, he downclassed Siegfried. He moved him into um, the air, he moved him into white trash land. Um, and this has been actually the case with a large number of representations of Siegfried in recent years. That not only has he actually sort of, uh, did, that, that they really sort of focus upon how Siegfried has sort of, has, has, has found himself in sort of the least privileged elements of society. Um, in Debt Mold, and a production uh, directed by Kay Metzger, uh, Siegfried begins uh, uh, forging the sword um, outside uh, what seems to be a very primitive RV. Um, and, and eventually he ends up uh, in a forge. I'm not quite so sure ha how that happens on the stage. Uh, but the kitchen has been a very common area for forging since 1999, when it first, when it, uh, when it first appeared in some ways uh, in, in Stuttgart in Jossi Wieler's production that we saw Act Two of yesterday. Uh, this was a production that sort of raised a number of, uh, of, uh, of eyebrows when it was first put on, Jossi Wieler being one of the more controversial uh, uh, directors in, uh, in Germany. Uh, but here we see sort of um, uh, Siegfried or Siegfried, however we're to read that, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Uh, here we see him uh, working away um, in, 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 in the kitchen. Um, uh, uh, this uh, the use of the kitchen is, is still going strong. Some of you might have seen the Klaus Gut production of Siegfried in Hamburg in 2009, but here Siegfried seems to be doing something a little bit questionable with a washing machine. Uh, uh, I don't know what. Has anybody seen this? Oh, they haven't. Okay. Um, I actually find uh, one of the most attractive of sort of, of current settings of Siegfried's forging is this one in Darmstadt, where in a John Dews production, it has a country western environment. That actually maybe uh, sort of helps, in, uh, sort of adds in some ways to the, these productions that are more whimsical. Um, so there's also a frequent tendency to um, treat Siegfried as a clown and to emphasize the comic elements of the plot vastly over the tragic elements, and indeed often the, the wanderer is turned into a figure of fun as well. Um, um, in fact, 